my talk um, somehow falls just after lunch, and I always have like less audience than I thought. So. But I'll try to keep you active as much as I can. Uh, I'll try to make it exciting. Okay. Um, he did formally introduce me, but I just want to put a little bit more details just to let you know who I am. Um, I have spent all my life in security. Um, I did a master's from SANS Technology Institute in, in, uh, in cyber security. I have over 30 certifications. Yes, I believe a lot in certifications. And one of those that I'm really proud of is GIAC, GIAC, uh, GIAC Security Expert, which I spent a lot of time, energy, and money to get that. <laughs> it's, uh, it was something. I, I always believed that when we take a training, we learn something. But when I prepare for a certification, there's always something more you learn in certification. So I always believe that. So I went for a lot. Uh, out of these, uh, around 20 plus are GX certification. So, and I guide uh, a lot of university students for that reason. So if they come out of uh, fresh out of universities and if they want to make a career in cybersecurity, what are the best options for them in different uh, domains of cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is as big as computers, right? So it doesn't mean everybody's working on the same thing. So in the same way, cybersecurity is not one thing. It's just so diverse, so many fields into it that I, I part-time do teaching assistant for SANS uh, for various courses, about 10 plus courses. I'm an SME for CompTIA certifications. If you're familiar with CompTIA Cloud Plus, Security Plus, uh, I'm one of those who wrote the questions for those. Uh, speaker, and I like uh, tennis. I'm a I play tennis every day. So if you guys are in Austin, I'm a local boy. Uh, come, <laughs> come challenge me on tennis. and. Uh, I do a bit of yoga and, and I cook a variety of stuff as well. So <laughs> I know some of you here in the audience uh, would love to uh, try my cooking. So please, <laughs> enjoy. I have uh, I'm married and I have a, a son and daughter. Thankfully, um, uh, by the way, my daughter is to ask me, Dad, uh, what did you learn with these 30 plus certifications? What what's your takeaway? And I, and, uh, and she's eight years old, by the way. So <laughs> and I was like thinking what to say, and I said. Uh, you know, I know, I understood that I don't know anything in this world. Seriously, the more you learn, you realize that we don't know anything in this world. <laughs> Seriously. All right, um, what's the agenda for today? Um, what are we trying to learn? I don't want to put a bullet points or anything. So I'm just going to put a very interesting thing for some of you, or probably you are already aware. I'm going to bring DevOps, AI, and supply chain into the security aspect. So there is a common aspect between all the three when I talk about security, exactly. So that is my main goal for today, okay? So just to set the context, I want to get some uh, myths away out of this. Some people assume DevOps means cloud, okay? And cloud means DevOps, okay? You don't have to. You can do a complete DevSecOps or DevOps on-prem, or you can do completely cloud with waterfall, and you don't have to do anything on DevOps on cloud. They are totally independent, but they can go together very well, right? You have the benefits of elasticity, scalability, and all of that with the cloud. But yes, I somehow I talk to different people and say, hey, I don't want DevOps because this cloud is expensive. I mean, they are not related, OK? <laughs> OK, uh, in order to understand security aspects of anything, I believe, firstly, we need to understand the uh, life cycle of it, right? So we all know we are all DevOps guys. But just a refresh of that is how the software development life cycle has evolved over the years and how it came from waterfall. There are many uh, projects even today still on waterfall for a, for a reason, so it's okay. So we work, and there is a quotation in security, especially in software security, that software security is independent of the dev life cycle. But the way we apply security is different. That means whether you build a software from waterfall or agile, it doesn't matter, it is operated in production, the attacks are the same. The, se the way you secure the software is, this, is independent, but the way we apply security is different in each activities, okay? So obviously, um, there are, the way it's done, it's different. But the last three I'm going to put together, sometimes because DevOps and DevSecOps and Agile, they go together, Agile kind of planning, and then the real implementation on the pipelines or everything you do in DevSecOps and all of this, OK? This, was the, uh, this is not probably new to many of you. And you will say, hey, I know this stuff. But I, I wanted to give you an idea when I talk about DevSecOps, a clarity of all of these things. The same I'm applying to AI. So people talk about AI. What's the life cycle in AI? Okay, if you Google out, there are so many things uh, people tell about AI life cycles. One thing that I really liked about is from the European uh, regulation body, which is ENISA, is how people start with a business use case. I have a business use case that I need to, for example, build a chatbot for my sales guys that should be able to answer questions. So I have a business idea in mind. Then I start, how does this chatbot answer the questions from? Where is the data coming from? So I, I, then I gather the data. Then you have the role of data scientists, right? who come together, build the data, and then the transform it into a lot of math stuff for you. So they are kind of data scientists. Then you think of a model. 
to build a model. At the end, even AI is software. So it's it's probably Python or R or whatever languages that you choose, it's a software. So and then um, let's take an example of, uh, for those who are probably new to AI, let's take an example of my uh, a house, okay? We know that for the last 20 years, a price of a house is like this. And you have certain features that there's a square foot of the house, there is an inflation percentage, there is a bedroom, bathroom. These are all the selection features. So you, based on all these features, now you want to make a prediction. What will be the value of my house in 2050? Accurately. Of course, if it is just a little bit data, by common sense, you look at it and say, oh, there's a 1.5% or three, three times the multiplying factor, it could be three times X today. So you can say it, but if the data is millions and billions of rows, you need uh, uh, machines to do that, right? And with a lot of parameters, a lot of hyperparameters around it, it's tough. So humans cannot do that. So you need to have AI there. So then you build a model, you feed in the data, and then you, once you build the model, you test it from the data. So you know that in 20, 2005, my house value was this. So let me ask the model and see in 2005, what was my value of the house? Because I didn't train it. So you kind of test the uh, model and then see it works. So you know the prediction is accurate and then you slowly release. And then you make updates just like GPT from 3.5 to 4 or whatever. This is the typical AI life cycle. And anytime we talk about security, the first thing that comes to our mind is attacks. If you don't understand the attacks, you can never secure it, right? You know there's a theft on your house, then you start thinking about locking the house, then there is an asset and all of that. So same way, even in uh, whether it is DevSecOps, the classical software or AI, or uh, supply chain, we need to first understand what is the attack here, right? In the classical softwares, we have these OWASP top 10. That's where we all started understanding in the AppSec world. So people say, hey, we have got uh, SSRF, I've got uh, SQL injection to cross site scripting to blah, 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 so many things. And then, you know, even in 2019, when the capital one hack ha happened on SSRF, it was not part of the top 10, by the way. So it's not just about the list of attacks that you see probably on OWASP or some SANS top 25 or not, uh, it's not about that it's always best to understand as many attacks as you can. That's always the goal, especially if you're an AppSec guy, not a developer side, especially if you're an AppSec guy. It's more important. Apps, thanks to us, a lot of community people have put together a lot of top 10. So they exist on all these references. Now, when these attacks existed and people started understanding these attacks, then they built training materials, they built defenses. This was the approach we took 20 years ago, right? Two days ago, but today in AI, we are probably starting to do the same thing that we did 20 years ago for AppSec. Today, AI is rapidly growing and we need to think of securing AI. And I am more interested in securing AI, not AI in security. I'm not putting AI in SaaS tools, DAS tools, or SPA tools. I'm more interested that there is a business use case that, for example, at an airport, you have a CCTV camera take, uh, capturing pictures of everybody, uh, everyone at the airport. And then you have to recognize that it's probably uh, not a terrorist or terrorist or something you have put a model for it to de detect that. So for such a, a business use case, how do I secure it? What are the attack vectors that are possible on these models, on this data? So all of this. So let's come back to our classical software. The answer to that was very simple because we have expertise of 20 years of many people where Gartner, for example, Gartner said, hey, I've got all these life cycle ask, uh, activities that you need to do. So this is not my topic for today. I'm not going to just show you this and say bye. So, but this was the title where I said, you're going to know the security activities. Everybody knows this. Right from plan to create to verify and all of this, there are different things that we need to do. But of course, the way that we do differs. Everybody, the way they implement these differs. But we are going to talk about those maturity models later on. But these are the typical classical activities. If you have a question, uh, every topic is, is an ocean on its own, right? As you all understand, it's hard to explain in just one hour of everything, but I, I just thought I'll put together. But if you talk about uh, in our own approach, what I thought the best way is in the life cycle of DevOps or DevSecOps, there are phases. Like we used to say design, code, review, test, and all of that in waterfall, but in DevOps, we call it phases from, um, we call it pre-commit phase or commit or acceptance and all of these things, but I added a little bit preparation phase as well. For example, in an agile team, so you hired a new person and you want to put this developer or somebody into your project team. First, you have to make sure the guy is trained on security awareness trainings or secure coding trainings. There is a level of training that this person has gone through to be able to put onto the project. I mean, you can't put a guy into the project and then start training, then that's not agile. Okay, that's not agile. Or obviously, we'll still do training in terms of continuous evolution, continuous improvements, but not doing everything at after assigning, right? So there's a preparation phase. Like, um, for each of these phases, uh, phases, there are different tools that I can talk about later on if you're interested. 
uh, what security tools can be applied in different phases. But like for example, pre-commit is all those where developers actually code. They actually sit on IDE platforms like Eclipse, Visual Studio, IDEA and all these things. They start uh, coding and then you know it's kind of called pre-commit. Uh, actually commit in Git for example is pushing to your own local repo. Push is actually when you push to a remote repository. That's where the build triggers, right? So in all of these phases, commit is actually continuous integration. That means I'm integrating all the components of my software and I'm building it. Continuous delivery is where the software is packaged and put into a repository ready for use. Maybe a container, maybe a war file, maybe a JAR file. A simple library can be anything. Maybe a, a, a virtual machine file. Uh, con uh, acceptance, you have tested it. That's continuous delivery. Then production, continuous deploy. CI, CD, people often misuse these terms. Uh, CD, there are two CDs actually. One is to de deliver and one is to deploy. When you deliver, it's not a production, it's to a repository. You store it and when you deploy, you're putting that uh, uh, artifact into a production. Okay, that's deploy. Continuous operations, uh, that means you're, the, the code that you push to the source control system has triggered a build that will continuously uh, do integration to delivery, to deploy, to operate. That level of maturity uh, I've seen in very, very few companies over the internet or like Netflix, Amazon, guys like this have done complete automation from the de development till the operations. Those, that is where I really call them as DevOps, going from dev to ops in a fully automated way. But sometimes people just put some tools on integration. They say, oh, yeah, we are DevSecOps, okay? So it's, it's scary. So that's why I thought, why not we really put a maturity model around this? Then I, I, I saw about the OASP one as well, which we will talk. So what exactly are the activities in these five phases point of view? If, if I have to go a little bit detailed. So in all these phases, uh, again, I'm not going to talk about each and every activity out here, um, but there is, a, you can perform your own research or if you're interested, we can talk. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can discuss as well. But uh, there's a lot of activities that people do on each phases of this and I dedicated the slide only for security tasks and I'm not talking about DevOps, but I'm talking about DevSecOps, security of each phases. Obviously, some of these go on to the pipeline. Uh, there are certain things that you can't do on the pipeline. For example, if you don't even write code, there's nothing on the pipeline. You have to write code, right? That's another thing maybe in the future like Copilot and all will evolve and then they will, you'll also write code automatically. That's a different thing. But as at this moment, I have Eclipse, I have Visual Studio, I have IDEA, all these platforms where I have IDE plugins. The moment I type the code, I need to know there's a vulnerability. That's IDE plugins. Then I run SAST on my own local PC as a developer and I see the vulnerabilities and everything, I fix it. Then I push the code to the repository which triggers a build. Then I again run the SAST on the pipeline and then it continues. So right from commit to acceptance to all of this, different activities can be automated and then they keep progressing, okay? So this was the different activities. Now, how did I build these activities is based on, I understood there are attacks like cross scripting and all of this from our top 10, 20 years ago, people started talking about this and then, uh, then we understood, we built some secure coding trainings and we did all of this. So let's switch our gears to AI. So the same way in AI, I really wanted to understand what are the attacks that are happening. And I, I went to RSA, I went to European government to ask them and I went of course ChatGPT and BARD and different tools and different conferences that I attended. I, I wanted to hear what attacks exist and this attack was mind blowing. It's so different, it's so different even. Let me give you one example. It's too complex for me to explain each of them because I don't know myself and I'm still exploring each of those. It's too complicated. So let me give you one example. In AI, when you're attacking AI, there is an attack called backdoor attack. And in classical software, we all know backdoor means for example, there is a port network port opened on the system where data is being exfiltrated. As one example, that's a backdoor on the system and an attacker tried to do this. In AI, the word backdoor is different. It means that, uh, for example, I have an image and I know this is a picture of a cat, okay? But I name it as a dog and then I train the model in a bad way and then I push this pre-trained models into the market. Now, there is, uh, it's really hard to know what kind of data was used to train this model but people have started downloading all the pre-trained models and they're using it. We have no idea there is a backdoor in the model, which means an incorrect way of labeling. Labeling means answering what is the value of that uh, picture. It's supposed to be cat, but they put it a dog and then train the model. So I can put uh, a terrorist photo and then call Joseph Biden or Joe Biden and I will train the model. And when in reality, the guy passing through the airport will be uh, considered benign uh, is good because his Biden is walking through the airport. So it can work like that. We don't know if there is a back door onto the model, which is different in terminology. So when you're talking about attacking AI, a lot of terminologies have changed and we end up confusing, especially if you're a cybersecurity guy, 
trust me, as I was like struggling, ah, back door I know is different. So same way, uh, I try to split this and I build this on my own. I try to build this, uh, separate this out of training data, model, and the inference. In AI, you call inference means it's production. That means you put the model in production and it's operating. So you make an inference out of it by posting a question like chat GPT, right? So a huge number of attacks are possible today on these things. There are so many white papers have been published by Stanford and uh, like Andrew and G, if you guys know these people, they publish so many articles that uh, cyber attacks are real and they have uh, in the last four or five years, the attacks on AI has rapidly gone up, rapidly gone up because everybody's interested to build a business use case out of AI models. So uh, this is scary stuff. So we need to do some security activities for this, right? We need to do some security activities, just like we build a kind of security plan for the classical software, like doing SaaS, DAST, and blah, blah, blah. What about AI? How do I secure this? So um, again, there is nothing that exists on the internet. So we just build something on our own right now. Um, I am not fully publishing these details yet because I don't have the authority right now, but I'm giving you a brief because this is something that we researched on our company. I'm just giving you a very brief of this one. In my opinion, uh, just following the life cycle, that's what we did in classical software. We have a life cycle right from design, we call threat modeling, coding, we call secure coding, uh, uh, attack, uh, testing, we call it uh, DAST and IAST and all of that. And then in production, we put a WAF and all of this. So we went, we followed a typical life cycle approach to secure stuff. Same way in AI, we are trying to follow the same life cycle approach that how do I approach a data security, the model security, the platform security where the model is running. So I approached in the same way and I try to go a little bit deeper into this where what is my actual goal behind each of these and what is my technique? That means goal, why, what exactly I need to achieve with this and how do I achieve what and how? Okay, so I, I try to build something like this and I, I'm trying to convince my management at this stage that I build a very comprehensive one like this and I can put, I, if I'm allowed, I want to push it to us eventually, but it's not, it's on the it's on the roadmap you can consider. So, but this um, is a very brief version of what we have in our company, where everything, how we can do in AI, talking about Python code, understanding the model, for example, um, how many of you understand, all of this falls into the concept of uh, trusted AI. How many of you have heard this term called trusted AI? A lot, right? Um, where the, it's security is not the only criteria in trusted AI. There's a lot of other parameters, operability and uh, explainability, for example. Today, to explain a model, how it works, it's nearly impossible. I have not seen anything from the past just two years that I've been working in AI, securing AI. How do I explain the behavior of a model? We can't. Uh, and in fact, I was listening to a video of uh, Satya Nadella of Microsoft CEOs telling that, and they, the guy was asking Satya, was like, why did you build uh, the OpenAI's GPT when you don't know how it works? And he said, in fact, we don't even know how our brain works today, but we just know how to live with it. That's it. That's the reality of neural networks in even in AI today. We nobody knows exactly how the neural network of AI models work. And there is a con problem, for example, concept called hallucinations. That means a model makes up an answer to you, which it thinks it's an answer, but it's a wrong answer. And it doesn't even know that's a wrong answer. And technically it's called hallucinations. And if you Google out model has hallucinations, you will see people always assume the answer coming out of chat GPT or BARD, it's, it's correct, but it's not because it's just making up an answer and it has no way to know it's correct or not. So there are problems like this and nobody can answer this. Even if you're a math genius, it's so hard to know uh, to why this model is making up answers like this. So that's that's how the, the math works, okay? So yeah, I was taking a course on AI where it's people talking about trigonometry, sine theta and cos theta. I was like, oh my God, I have to go back to my childhood, right? Anyway, come back again, switch gears to the classical softwares. A little bit here and there. Uh, now, in classical softwares, we know there was a, a life cycle, we know there was an attack, we, so we build an activity. What about maturity? Okay, now we progress on maturity. So I, when, we, when we talk about maturity, I often see people confused on these four different things. Um, I'm not talking about DevOps maturity or uh, the program maturity. Sometimes a team is assigned to say, hey, you are a DevOps guy now, you need to make sure there is a DevOps culture in my, in my team, in my company. That's a program maturity. I'm not talking about a program maturity. I am talking about security, so definitely two and four. But within two and four, I'm more interested in number two, where I'm talking about each project. So for example, a guy here is having a project on his own. He's a project manager. She is another project manager. Each project team is implementing DevSecOps on their own. Now, how do I know? My team told me, yeah, I did SaaS on the pipeline. I did SEA tools on my pipeline. I did IaaS tools on the pipeline. but 
how do I improve this? Where do, where do I go from here now? So then there, there needs to be a framework that should be available to people say, oh, this is where I am. Probably this is my possible potential improvements, right? So I looked out at what are the possible frameworks that exist in DevSecOps in the market. So, and before I understand that, I research what does it mean to mature? What do you mean by maturity at all? So, okay, today I did uh, SAST, I did all these activities on the pipeline, it works well. What, is, what does it mean? So I thought, uh, after talking to different people, I thought, if you can make everything as code, this is the actual concept of DevSecOps and DevOps where everything has code. Everything as code is the ultimate target, but people often uh, don't do that in every aspect of DevOps. So uh, there are certain things in terms of tool configurations to compliance to test scripts or documentation, everything, or a little bit KPIs. Does your tools like whether you use GitHub or GitLab or TeamCity, I don't know, whatever CI CD systems that you use, are you able to generate KPIs out of your own builds that will be helpful to derive the improvements? That was the goal of maturity models where to understand, hey, what are my KPIs out of these builds? Like, for example, the number of vulnerabilities, the, the time it's taking to patch a vulnerability in production. Why was the whole, what was the whole point of DevSecOps? That why, why I had to leave the waterfall model and come here? Because in the past, to change a vulnerability, uh, it takes a lot of weeks or months. But in Dev, DevSecOps world, that I just change the code and push it, it's in production straight away if I'm truly DevOps, right? So the time to patch a vulnerability was significantly reduced in DevOps. That was a, one of the reasons people moved. So these kind of KPIs try to help people. What are the uh, 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 maturity factors? Okay, And of course, in DevOps, we bought a very big, great balance between the three. People process technology. I really mean this, that in Waterfall, sometimes people overdid it. They, they just put SaaS tools, and they used to run for days and days and days, find every vulnerability, uh, and then do it. And DevOps, they did it very lightweight, just focus on the critical stuff, and that's it they release. So sometimes it's they either underdo it or overdo it. It's finding the right balance is really depending on that business, what you're working on. So this is one of the key aspects as well. So why do I need to really think about maturity? Why, what are the benefits? So like I said, you will know where you are today, where I need to reach tomorrow in terms of improvements. I need to know how I improve. And of course, all the other uh, kind of benefits that you can imagine, like obviously I'm able to meet the market very fast and, uh, and all of this. So I have researched what are the industry available frameworks on uh, maturity models. One of them was GitLab by itself was providing. I'm sure so, uh, most of you know the GitLab one, right? So GitLab provides its own uh, DevSecOps maturity model. And I thought I'll quickly show you that if, uh, if I can move this. So it's just a nice PDF where it tells you uh, if you go into the GitLab, uh, like for example, on all those uh, numbers, and it, it has like a, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, categories, yeah, six categories in which each category has questions and then you put numbers on 0, 1, 2, 3, 5 and I say, oh, where am I? Okay, did I do this? Did I do this? Maybe I'm at 3 and you answer it. At the end, uh, you just sum up all the questions. There are about 3 for each, maybe 18 to 20 questions. Not that hard, just answering 20 questions. And then um, if, if probably you're at from 0 to 100 and then you will know whether at what stage of the DevSecOps uh, thing you are. Uh, this was a good one. Uh, you can try as well if you like. And this is the next one, which is from OASP DevSecOps model. Obviously, we are at OASP, so we do talk about OASP. Uh, the good thing about this is it'll, it's a little bit more comprehensive than GitLab, and it is, it is some, it's not a PDF style anymore. So it is more uh, Jira or agile-oriented agile, agile uh, oriented tool. So I like the, uh, the uh, OASP a little bit more than that one. So if I, uh, yeah. If I come back here, uh, there is this OWASP metrics where you can, it gives you on a scale of level one, level two, level three, level four on all the SaaS, DAST, every activity that you can think of on, a, on, on the company. And um, you can even build um, an implementation like a, a, a nice graph like this. For example, I, um, uh, what is, uh, if I say SaaS for applications, you can do SaaS for infrastructure, which is infra as code. And you can do SAST for applications. So for example, at level five, I eliminate dead code. I'm doing this. So they gave level one definition of SAST, level two definition of SAST, and all of this in OASP ones, which is again another good one that you can try. And um, uh, another one that I try, uh, uh, that I also found interesting was the Datadog DevSecOps machine board. How many of you are familiar with Datadog? 
I, I don't represent them, but I'm just telling you. This is an interesting one as well, but this is a pure web-based one on their own portal where you end up answering questions on their own site, which will build you a nice radar like this, which will tell you on five or six different categories as areas that they assess you, where you are, and so that you can find improvements, where you can go from there. But this uh, is something that is on their SaaS side, so which means you end up answering your, you end up putting your information into their portal. Uh, if you're okay with that, you can try with that. So it, uh, it, the 30 plus multiple choice questions and you have an, uh, on a category of beginner, intermediate, advanced and expert level on each of those activities. So I, I assessed all these three, all these three maturity models and I, I was not satisfied with all the three, honestly, personally, personally. It's just my personal opinion. So I, I built something on my own. So I thought, okay, uh, first, how do people go to DevOps? You know, sometimes people say, hey, I'm, I'm going to DevOps, but um, so my own approach to DevSecOps, first, I said, okay, maybe you're at Waterfall today, some of you. So first, you put SaaS tools or you do SEA tools and you, and you go into continuous integration and then you go into continuous delivery and then you go into continuous deploy and then into continuous operate, right? It's a phase by phase approach. Until you reach the automation till the operations, you are not DevSecOps. You are probably DevSecInt because you just did till integration, that's it. We are not DevSecOps and, and that's the terms I came up with on my own. I know I'm crazy, but uh, DevSecInt, uh, DevSec uh, Delivery, DevSec Deploy, DevSecOps. I call people DevSecOps only when they reach really all the activities of security on the pipeline. Some teams, and I have seen that they do CI pipeline is different from CD pipeline is different from CO pipeline. So they have different pipelines for different uh, phases like this, which is still okay. But if you're able to automate till the end like this, then you're truly DevSecOps. In my opinion, if you're just doing one or two activities on the pipeline, you're able to trigger the build, that's not DevSecOps, in my opinion. There's another reference I wanted to give you, focusing on the CI-CD part of DevOps. DevOps is a much bigger uh, notion, but just on the uh, DevOps one, there's an interesting one that I found, maybe the author is in this room, I don't know. Uh, the, this talks about just the activities on the pipeline that you can do. Personally, I don't think this covers everything, but it is a reference that from WASP, so I thought I want to show it. I would personally update this in more from CI and CD and CO and all of these different phases of pipelines and different activities showing on the pipeline. But there is one reference that you want to talk. So what I changed, what is that I changed into this? So I did, I took all the possible activities all the possible act security activities, I call them security activities. SAST is one for me. I assume you all understand what is SAST here. So, I, so for each of the activities that I can put off the pay, uh, on a pipeline, so I define my own framework of maturity model like this. And I call, if the activity is not done at, on, uh, at all, okay, there is an, uh, a security policy in the company that everybody must run source code scan, okay, for example. So if the activity is not done, it's level zero. You didn't do it. Okay, uh, if it's manually done, it's not done in a pipeline. It's just manually done, but it's probably not part of the pipeline. Okay, you're level one. And you automated it. You put the scan on the pipeline, but you have a report which you're analyzing offline. Okay, you're not analyzing on the pipeline in an automated way. Then, okay, it's level two. Or you know that you're reading the report from through a REST API, and you know that these have X number of critical vulnerabilities newly introduced by a developer. You send an alert saying that there's a new critical vulnerability found, you're level three. Or for example, level four, you define a proper quality gate and you fail the build because you did not meet your defined criteria, right? So I defined a, a framework like this on all the possible activities, which we are about to open source as well eventually. Uh, I just give you one that the same example that I just said uh, for the SaaS point of view, how you can define maturities because unless there is a maturity framework in an organization, I believe uh, project teams will not uh, move forward in terms of improvements. Otherwise, everybody will say, are you doing SaaS? Yes, I'm doing tasks. Are you have a vulnerability report? Yes, we have a vulnerability. But true DevSecOps of full automation, failing the builds will bring true benefits in terms of time to market, uh, the real business needs that we have. Sometimes security should not come in the way of business, right? We have, uh, uh, always it's the opposite. Security comes in the way of business and we try to block it. But in a true DevSecOps, security will not come in the way of business. It will let it happen. So uh, my opinion is if you have such frameworks, and you're able to build um, a, a simple calculation like this. So what we are trying to do in our organization is for each of the activity, uh, what is the current maturity scale and what is the target for each of the projects? Imagine I have hundreds of applications in the company. Maybe the Defect Dojo is giving me lots and lots of applications. So I go to each and every project and say, please, based on my maturity framework, look at this and tell me in which level are you, if it applies to you. For example, some people don't have web applications. They don't do yes or dust at all. 
So it's okay, it's not applicable for them. They are desktop based applications, but they still need to do SCA and SAST. So based on the applicability, um, the level of maturity currently and the targeted one they do, and then I do a simple percentage and I'm able to build, uh, build a nice charts like this and to, uh, and to tell my management that, hey, the current maturity level of DevSecOps of my pro of these projects at the portfolio level is like this. Does it make sense? Does this? Okay. Just switching gears to supply chain security. Okay, um, I know, uh, what are we doing? Okay, good. Uh, supply chain security is much bigger problem than I thought initially when I was trying to understand this, hey, uh, is it just all the components that we have? No, actually, uh, when I when I try to dig this um, exactly on where exactly is the supply chain problem for me, problem is actually everywhere, right from the source code to the source control systems to the package managers like so Nexus repository, JFrog repository, whatever you have, attacks can happen everywhere on the build and CICD systems to container supply chain, which is even bigger problem because in containers, you have a base image that you just take from wherever source you like and everywhere there is a supply chain problem. So it's huge, orchestration problem, uh, cloud supply chain, vendor supply chain, so many supply chains have uh, the attack surface kept on increasing and I said, oh my God, this is, uh, this is scary for me. And one key point around um, supply chain I want to highlight is the difference between vulnerable component and malicious component. A very few people in supply chain understand this point that I can write a huge malicious code with zero vulnerabilities. I can write a huge malicious code with zero vulnerabilities and none of your SEA tools will detect it. Because you, a malicious code for example, delete all the hard disk data once you have my library and runs it. That's a perfectly functional data. It can delete, but if you run SaaS tools it works because there's no vulnerability in it. Right? It's malicious. It was written with bad intent. The problem that is growing in the last one or two years that we have seen, especially reports like Sonatype, they were publishing where they were telling you the growth of malicious components over vulnerable components. So I'm not interested in vulnerabilities right now. I'm more concerned on malicious components out in the GitHub, out in every damn website that is there and my developers end up going and taking from whatever source they like. So we don't even know what kind of, uh, another bigger problem is, okay, now I understood component is a vulnerable component. How do I rate this? For a vulnerability, there is something called CVSS. There is a standard. I can put a CVE to it. But for malicious, there is no standard in the internet. There is no way I can communicate to people that this component is vulnerable. There is no standard. There is no way to communicate. So that is where the attackers are exploiting and they put all the malicious components because no, nobody can communicate about this to anybody. There is no standard in the internet. So what commercial companies are doing like Sonatype or Synopsys Black Duck or many other uh, commercial companies that I've seen like White Source, what they're doing is they created their own database and they create their own database and say, and they do, uh, give their own ranking in their own identifier, which there's no standard because that's why they wrote on their own. And then they say, hey, this component we investigated on your behalf. We found it uh, uh, malicious. Of course, there's a vulnerability, but it, we found it malicious. Please do not use Node.js, blah, blah, whatsoever. Whatever. So they put that information into their own database. Now this is the benefit of going to commercial products on SCA than the open source. I'm sorry if it hurts anybody's feelings that I didn't like SCA tools which are uh, open source because of one of these reasons. None of the SCA tools uh, which are open source provide a malicious component information to us because it, it's expensive. You need to have your own research happening on all the libraries out in the market, all the Node.js, all the Python libraries, all the Java components, it's hard. So Google thought, let me address this problem in my own way. So they created something called trusted OSS. I don't know if you have ever Googled out for this. Google, uh, Google's approach to these malicious components, they created trusted OSS, but unfortunately they made it accessible only to the GCP users right now, the Google Cloud Platform. So it's not open source to make it to public. So they are going and researching every, yes. What about OSC scanner? Is that number scanner? Uh, it, I, I don't think it can detect malicious as of as of my investigation few months ago. Yeah, sure. Uh, but they are all good in terms of vulnerability. So you know there is a CVSS for it. There is NVD database or other databases. It will go and give, get you the CVE and CWE entry or CVE entry from it and then publish to you. So they are great tools. For vulnerabilities, it's okay. But I am more concerned on malicious because the attack uh, exists inside the binary there and it's right away impacting me. And if you look at the Sonar type reports, it's scary because the malicious components have gone 742 percent just from 2022 to 2023. They released in the April and that's rapidly going right now. So this is a, a word on uh, supply chain. And now the problem has even intensified in AI. 
because we have a, a GitHub like uh, thing called uh, Hugging Face in AI where everybody is creating pre-trained models. We don't even know what's happening on the supply chain security on AI. It has intensified. This is even a bigger problem. Okay. So talk about supply chain, people often ask me this question. Hey, you confused me so much that, uh, okay, I, I want a log 4 j binary, for example. Which version should I use? Uh, like, uh, okay, I'm confused. There are some vulnerabilities uh, on some component on, on the old version or the new ones are, uh, for example, malicious being released into the market. So I can't use the word latest. Have you guys seen in many GitHub projects, people just uh, put on Dockerfile. If you open a Dockerfile source, I assume you guys understand what Dockerfile is. If you open a Dockerfile source, they'll say uh, from tag where you import a base image, colon latest. Don't ever do that. If you do a colon latest, you are becoming vulnerable to supply chain attacks. That means you are automatically taking every new component in the market Probably the version that you originally took was good, but every build you're taking a new one available in the internet, that is probably having malicious problem. So supply chain is growing in the world because everybody is trying to do latest, latest, latest. So, so you tell me I can't do old version because it's vulnerable. I can't do latest version because it's supply chain. What do I do then? Okay. So there is a talk about dependency pinning. So this is another concept. So, and there is an argument on the internet. Should I do dependency pinning or should I not do dependency pinning? What is dependency pinning? That means I explicitly tag the version number in my software and I force that only this well-tested version can be used. Does it make sense? And some people argue that dependency pinning is bad because uh, they think that their software is never updated and it could become vulnerable with time. But again, it's up to you. You have to do, you have to take a balance here. There's no right approach. Okay, some of the best practices I put uh, for supply chain security. First and foremost, you have an AppSec. So supply chain is kind of overlapping with AppSec and CloudSec and everything that you can think of. Uh, secure your build system, CI/CD build systems. When I, when I talk about securing your CI/CD build systems, I categorize this into four different things. Um, first, the uh, platform. The, for example, you use Jenkins, GitLab, GitHub, whatever platforms that you have. The platform itself, does it have HTTPS, simple things? And does it have two-factor authentication enabled for every user logging in? Is, is the authorization well controlled on each project that you create on Jenkins? Every project sometimes is just opened on access control to everybody. And sometimes, uh, and I audit different projects in different companies and I'm surprised. People just open up uh, access to every project as default because they're developers, it makes it easy for them. So, uh, and the second thing is the project configuration, which I was mentioning, apart from platform, then the project on, Git, uh, on each uh, Jenkins, then the pipeline. So how do I secure the pipeline and then the application which is built on the pipeline? So in order to understand supply chain, in order to mitigate the risks of supply chain, you focus on all the four categories, the platform, project, pipeline, and application, all the four. So in our company, we end up writing guidelines and requirements and tool selections for each of these and we push it really hard so that we are at least protected from supply chain, okay? Obviously, the other specific activities like the developer environment. Sometimes no matter what I do on the CI/CD pipeline, developers have Eclipse and Visual Studios. They have third party like plugins that they just install from anywhere. That is another attack surface of supply chain, right? It's not just about the CI/CD, but the developers workstations are also supply chain problem. That's even a bigger problem. Uh, and, I, and unfortunately, there is no tool available in the market that can scan all my developer PCs on the supply chain. This is a big open attack surface to attackers and I'm telling please come and attack me because I have no solution. That's where we are today. Uh, secrets and, uh, yeah, and I said uh, use commercial tools for SCA for that reason, by the way. And education, of course. That's it. Thank you. If you're interested, just connect with me on LinkedIn, by the way. Are you going to share your slides now? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Ah, I should have put a QR code, but yeah. I guess there's a mechanism. I don't know. It's my first time I'm talking at uh, OASP, so if they ask for me, I'll say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Questions? Yes. Have you, have you looked at feeding all of your uh, supply chain issues over into OWASP dependency track? Yeah. Since it can now um, do the hardware building materials, software building materials, and yeah. just about any building materials you yes. want. Yes, it, it's a good point. I uh, this was not a question, but a point that you raised. Thank you for that. And I forgot to mention about the S bomb. How many of you truly understand what's an S bomb? Firstly, let me ask this fundamental very question. How many of you truly understand what's an S bomb? Uh, no, I, I, I want to know as a, lay, a layman that I don't. But that's what's asked for. 
So in software bill of materials list of you know, all the software packages in my environment, the latest version. Yeah. And wh why should I do that? Because by, re by re customers and regulators demanded it. It's, it's yeah, you're right. I'll just put it in a slightly different. For example, you go to a supermarket and you buy a toothpaste. Okay. What is the first thing that we do whenever we buy something, we turn it back and see what are the, now what are the key ingredients this is made of? Right? And probably how much sugar does it have, the nutrition information, we look at it as. And we know, for example, this has 50 grams of sugar. I know there's a risk, but I'll still buy it. It's a donut, I'll buy it. People at least know the risk and then they buy the product. Does it make sense? Imagine if I sell you a bread that doesn't have nutrition information or any key ingredients and I tell you just go and buy it. People have no idea what does it contain. That is the problem in software today. We make binaries and we ship it to the customers and tell them, I'm not going to tell you what is inside the software, but you just take the software, that's it. That's where the SBOM came in and said, there is a standard, there are two standards by the way in SBOM. One is called Cyclone DX and one is SPDX. Have you guys ever heard about this? So Cyclone DX is a standard saying that every software created anywhere in the world, people have to uh, put all the components and vulnerability information transparently to the guy using that software, right? So that the guy who's using the software and installing on their desktop or whatever systems, they know, oh, these are the components it had, these are the vulnerabilities of the components which are known, I'm okay to take risk and then install it. It builds transparency to every user who uses your software. Does it make sense? Imagine the world last 20 years, uh, we would never published our S-bombs to people and we're just blindly telling them, this is coming from Microsoft, so you have to use it. This is coming from Google, you have to use it. But the problem even with Office 365, when Microsoft released it was good, but it ended up as an executable on various websites and people changed the binary to whatever things they attached to the software and then we install it. But that was not the software which they created at the first place by Microsoft. Had they published SBOM, we will know that, oh, these are the components that were supposed to have, now I can compare. So this is the customer demand that was growing fundamentally that, hey, I need to know what's in your software, what are the vulnerabilities, so I can accept the risk and then install it. If you give me a black box exe file or an executable and you're telling me to just install it without any transparency, that's a problem. The second version of the SBOM is called SPDX, which is a different standard which was created more for legal reasons, the IP intellectual property reasons. So the standards are different. Today for vulnerability information, you look at Cyclone DX. For legal reasons, you look at SPDX. Does it make sense? Sorry, I got tired. You can handle both of those and then you don't have to, because OWASP is Cyclone DX, and then you can just use dependency track and then you get the end result yes. for all your audience. Yes, all these SCA, SCA tools, they are trying to automatically do this for you because NIST has, obviously NIST has asked for it to generate it because for a reason they asked it so that every software is transparent. Now, thankfully, everybody is using SCA tools, at least some of them. And uh, you know, it's not an additional task for them. All these tools are just able to generate the SBOM file for you. You download the SBOM from your own build, and then you publish the e binary and the SBOM to your customer. Just like a nutrition label on a toothpaste when I go there. I look at it, what is inside, and then buy the, the toothpaste, right? So every binary must have an SBOM. Now the point is SBOM can be updated by anybody when I just publish it. That's where the digital signature comes in onto the file again. So some companies are even digitally signing the along with the binary, so they tell you to do the hash verifications and then refer to the SBOM. Make sense? Any, any questions? Thank you guys. Thank you.